Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with all of you today and to speak about the journey of the universe, a huge topic and a huge journey in making this film, creating a book, a DVD educational series of interviews, and a website. And we hope that this will be used for education in high schools and colleges, but also community centers, churches, synagogues for discussion to generate thinking about our moment, our critical time in human history on planet Earth, and what we are facing in terms of social, political, and environmental problems of enormous scope, of enormous challenge. So how did this journey begin? It's been a long, long process. But I'd like to tell you and take a step back of my journey and how it weaves with this journey. In the 60s, I was involved with civil rights, with the anti-Vietnam War uh, protests. I was in college in Washington, DC. And it was a tumultuous time. It was a difficult time of immense struggle, of immense uncertainty. And I left after college and a master's degree in English to go to teach literature in Japan at a college there, which transformed my life because I got perspective of a different culture, of a different way of living, of different religious systems. I became very interested in Buddhism and Confucianism, which is the cultural glue which makes the Japanese so filled with reciprocity, with humaneness, with a sense of the societal roles and so on. But it was during that time that I also was reading Thomas Berry's papers. This is 1973-74. They weren't published, they were just mimeographed papers, and I was fascinated, intrigued by this person who had studied Western history and culture, and also Asian religions, culture and literature. And he was putting together something of a cultural story that was stunning, vast, and deep. So I wrote him because I wanted to get a copy of his book on Buddhism. And to me, the miracle of my life is that he wrote back. And that letter and subsequent letters I have saved over the years um, began a long journey. So that after two years in Japan, when I returned, and I went to meet him in Riverdale, where he had a center for the study of world religions. This is just north of New York City, on the Hudson River with the great tides coming in and out and the palisades across these 50 million year old rock structures. A very powerful place that was, the Riverdale Center for Religious Research. And outside his window was a 400 year old oak tree that he dedicated one of his books to, in fact. And I can remember this February day, bright, cold, brilliant, sun shining on that river and walking into the sun porch, and there was Thomas Berry. It's one of those moments you remember everything about the day. But you also feel, as I felt, I'm meeting a great teacher. I'm meeting a wisdom keeper. And that meeting in 1975 um, led to all kinds of extraordinary things. I began to study with him in the History of Religions program at Fordham University that he had created, and he had hundreds of students who would come to Fordham because he knew and understood not just the texts and history of these traditions, but their spiritual import, why they had sustained people over time, why they had spoken to the sufferings of people, why they could help people manage death, why they contained stories that assisted people in navigating their own life. So he brought these traditions, Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism, indigenous traditions, the, the religions of the West, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. He had the whole scope of these traditions and a library of 10,000 books, many in the original languages. So this was a community that he created at Fordham and at the Riverdale Center where we had lectures and discussions and brought people in over many years. And it was part of that great community of students. Uh, it was during that time that I met John Grimm, who turned out three years later uh, in a marriage ceremony 
uh, led by Thomas Berry, to be my husband. So, but meeting John was also one of these great moments in the journey. Because I remember just the summer after meeting Thomas, I was there in the fall at Fordham and walked into a room where I was studying Sanskrit with one of the other professors. They sit down and we're doing our Sanskrit and reading the Bhagavad Gita and so on. And all of a sudden, this door opens, the wind almost blows in, and there is John, long beard, cut off shorts, and he had been all through that summer walking in the Sawtooth Mountains of Idaho. This was John from the Midwest region, from North Dakota, salt of the earth, but filled with the love of nature, and also later to become a great scholar of indigenous peoples, and our journey continued in that direction too. So John, Thomas, and I began to work together, helping Thomas on, with his papers, editing his books over time. And what a great moment that was. All of those years at the Riverdale Center, every Saturday during the school year, having gatherings of people, having potluck dinners and so on, quite extraordinary. And into that mix in 1982 came Brian Swim. That was another amazing moment. And when Thomas met Brian, who is a scientist, a cosmologist, if you will, um, Thomas said, I have met my Plato, meaning here is his dialogue partner, history of religions, the sciences, astronomy and physics, and biology and chemistry and so on, that Brian studied to bring together what was Thomas's great vision of a new story. So just as he had studied and we studied with him these stories of the world's religions, Thomas began to move not just within the bounds of cultural history, but also earth history. And why? And this is why he uses this term geologian, the study of the whole earth and its unfolding. But it wasn't just because he wanted to see these different periods of earth history. He wanted to create a sense of the story of the earth, what he would later call even the dream of the earth, that earth has a story that we can read, just as geologists will read, especially in the western parts of the US and all over the planet, they'll read the stratification of rocks and stones to see that story um, and bring us into a sense of time, like Lauren Isley did with his amazing book, The Immense Journey. So Thomas, in 1978, wrote a small piece called The New Story, and there he was saying, we need to bring together this unfolding story of the universe that in 150 years, the sciences are giving us all the pieces of it, from the great flaring forth of the early universe to the emergence of galaxies and stars. And now that we know there are literally billions of galaxies in the universe, to the formation of our planet and our solar system 4.5 billion years ago. What a journey. And finally, the emergence of life here on the planet with the first cell and then multi-cells. And then finally, the early plants. Lauren Isley has a beautiful story of the earth with no flowers. And then he speaks about how many millions of years ago, all of a sudden the earth came alive with flowers and plants and colors and so on. So we are imaging ourselves, if you will, back into this sense of a great story, a developmental time, and our participation in it. Because what Brian and Thomas then put together over a 10-year period from 1982 to 1992 was the first book to tell this in a coherent narrative, the epic of evolution. And it's called The Universe Story. The Universe Story to say that we come from the burst of stars, that out of a supernova, all the elements of our body have emerged, and that the life forms, the carbon-based life on this planet, actually has been derived from the explosion of stars. So in this film, we are saying the stars are our ancestors. That's a new take, isn't it? 
Um, that is what we're calling deep time. And here it's not just geological time, but it's the time of the cosmos that has birthed life over billions and billions of years. So the sense of a new story, science-based, within a narrative framework, using metaphors to bring alive the scientific story itself. But the idea of Thomas and Brian Swim, John Grimm and myself was, it, this is not just a beautiful story, which it is. It is not only a story of magnificence of life forms and the study of it by the sciences, but it is a story which grounds us in a sense of our purpose because it raises the questions like all of the world's religions do in their creation stories. Where have we come from? Why are we here? How do we belong? And what is our work? As Thomas said in one of his most beautiful books, we have a great work. We have work to be done at this particular moment in human history. And there, therefore, he would speak about this as a cosmology that is functional, a functional cosmology. And that means that the story of magnificence that evokes in us awe and wonder and beauty and astonishment and mystery and powers beyond full explanation of this journey. But he would say our responsiveness to that process is also requiring of us a responsibility for its continuity, for its flourishing. Because Thomas was deeply disturbed by the destruction that was taking place and is taking place around the planet. The fragmentation of so social systems and communities, which are obvious, but also the immense loss of species, the extinction of life, and the fact that we are losing more species in this particular time than has happened on Earth since the extinction of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. Some scientists are calling this the sixth extinction period, the others being caused by meteors or different aspects of ice age changes and so on. But this extinction is being caused by us. We are now determining the processes in which the future of life will go forward which animals will live and die, which insects, which plant forms, which ecosystems will survive. That is requiring of us at this particular moment, new forms of economics, new forms of education, new forms of politics, new forms of religion that are going to be aligned with these processes of evolution, these processes that have birthed life. And that is what this project is trying to move us toward. So once again, awakening in us that sensibility that we are part of and participating in the emergence of vast complex systems of life. And that this arc of evolution has brought us from lesser complexity to greater complexity, from a sense of simple organisms to immensely complicated organisms, including ourselves as self-reflexive participants in a process. So it's not that we are dominating this process, but we need to, some people would say, steward it, which may be a bit managerial, but we need to learn how to participate in these processes. Now, in telling then this journey of the universe, in making this film, in writing a book, in interviewing scientists and environmentalists uh, and others who are inspired by this perspective, we are suggesting that this particular framework, it's not the answer to all our problems, but it is a framework that has a possibility of overcoming difference racial difference, tensions that divide us, and many African Americans, Native Americans have been deeply inspired um, by this process. It also has the possibility of showing us how we can build 
eco-cities, how we can help build green buildings that are in consonance with, as David Orr and other people have done, with these processes of nature. Um, therefore, this sense is, as I say, a functional cosmology. But let me bring it back to the deeper dimensions of this journey. And that is to say, why are we destroying ecosystems, nature? Why are we diminishing life? Uh, certainly, there are unintended consequences of progress, of modernity, and so on. But one of the deeper senses here is that we see nature as objective. We see it as out there. We see it as something that we can use as resource. We can cut down forests. We can diminish fisheries. Uh, we can use things for our own good, including extractive oil, natural gas, and so on, despite the fact the Gulf is being destroyed or even our groundwater is being destroyed by natural gas. So this is saying in its heart that nature is not just a resource. Nature is the source of life. Nature is something that has immense subjectivity, interiority, spiritual value, aesthetic value, not just economic value. Why is it that we seek the beauty of nature in oceans, in mountains, in river places? Why does it give us fulfillment and renewal? At this particular point in human history, it's not just renewable energies to replace fossil fuel. It's a renewable human energy that we seek. And as we are in resonance with these processes, as we understand our own huge history and embed ourselves in deep time, in geological time, in earth time, in cosmic time, we have the possibility of renewing the energies that in turn will renew the face of the earth. That is what this journey is about, a renewal of energies for the flourishing of life on planet earth amidst an earth community. Thank you very much.